Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. Book of Matthew, chapter 28. We're going to finish it today. God's gift to us, and truly it is uh, what, what a book it has been to alleviate a lot of the anxieties that you might have about true teachings from Father's Word. Matthew laid it out where anyone can understand. And here we have... Um, back to the crucifixion, and Christ now has been placed in uh, Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, and a big stone was rolled to the mouth of it, and the Kenites wanted two guards put there, like two witnesses for Satan, you might say, to make sure that none of, of Christ's men would come and steal the body away in the night, because Christ had made it pretty clear he, he was going to resurrect. And that they didn't want that. That would make it worse than ever. So um, they had the two guards there. So meanwhile, chapter 28, we go back to that time, and we pick it up with verse 1, word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalena and the other Mary to see the supplica. Here, here, this one that had seven demons and converted to following the Lord Jesus Christ, his word. She hung her whole life on that, and Christ blessed her for that. But th they were there to see and prepare the re remainder of the preparation service. Verse 2, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Now, never let anyone tell you otherwise. The angel of the Lord is God himself. It's his angel. It's his, in his di dimension, brought here in person. And because of their love for the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten, He's, he knew they couldn't roll that stone away. He moves it for them and sits on it. Now, what is this going to do to the two witnesses that Satan has? They're going to freak out, okay? Verse 3, his countenance, his uh, countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow the very presence of God. Verse 4, And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. They passed out cold. There was nothing they could do. The very presence of God put them down. And uh, there was nothing they could say or do, and God would see to it. Verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. That's who you're looking for. Verse 6, he is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. He said, just, just the rocks move now and just... Come on in. Take, take a look. See here. Verse 7. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I, I want to emphasize, I have told you. Now, wait a minute. This is the angel of the Lord God Almighty. 
when did the Lord God Almighty tell them he would precede them to Galilee? Well, listen carefully and learn a little of the Trinity. It happened back in verse 32 of chapter 26. Um, then, and I'll start with verse 31. Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I, I want to emphasize the I again, after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. So you see, who said, I will go before you? Who, who said, I have told you? He didn't say Christ has told you here in um, this 28th chapter in verse 7. He said, I have told you. So who was speaking, the Father or the Son? Or, correct answer, they are the same. They are one and the same. So you have to take a little deeper look after the resurrection. That once the flesh was transfigured, then we have uh, only, after all, we have only one God. I know this may throw some off, but I want to tickle your, your nervous system just a little bit to cause you to think. Because clues like this are only laid out for those that have wisdom to understand our Father's Word. Then you can better understand John chapter 14 where Christ would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. What does that mean? They're the same. <coughs> different, dispensate, di different dimensions, of course. <coughs> but um, so it is. Don't, don't let that throw you off or anything, and if you don't quite understand it, put it on the shelf and let it sit there, because the angel of the Lord has told them, uh, you were told before, he's risen, and he's going into Galilee. That shouldn't be any mystery to you. Verse 8, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher, and fear with fear and great joy, that's reverence and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. Some of them would believe, some of them wouldn't. We have many accounts of this in verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail, or good morning. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. He had risen. There's another account where it would say that he told Mary Magdalena not to touch him, which properly translated it means, don't hold me up. I have not yet ascended to the Father. But here we have the Father ascended in the angel of the Lord to him when he did. And what, what a blessing this would be for this one possessed of seven demons. Yet she lived to witness this with her own eyes, her own soul, that Christ would be so kind to her, would be so patient with her. But he did not tell her, do not touch me. He said, don't hold me up. I've got to go in another book. And many people think that was a little rude. It wasn't. It was the properly translated. It's very kind and... Um, and concerning. Verse 10, what did he say? And then Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. And again, this was, this was reported throughout the word, throughout the gospel. They should have immediately gone there. But do you know something? We, we know of one case in, in one book where Two of them would even go down to a place called Warm Springs, being translated, and warm baths. They took baths and were walking back uh, to join the others, and Christ joins in with them as they walk. They, even knowing he was supposed to resurrect, assumed him dead. 
who's walking with them. So when you think of, O oh, ye of little faith, sometimes you wonder and you know of a fact that God blinded some of these whereby we could learn from it to know and strengthen our faith in knowing when he says something, when he said, I'm going to be in Galilee, you can count on it. It's just as he said in the book of Revelation, all the things he would do for his elect, he's going to do it. He does do it. It's his promise. He always keeps those, those promises. So it should strengthen your faith to know and to receive the word of God and know he is God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that Spirit dwelling within us even, giving us wisdom and knowledge that uh, we can comprehend and better understand what he teaches us. For what he teaches us is a road map, a road map to eternity. You want to stay on the right road. You don't want any detours, and you want to listen to him. He will never deceive you. He will never misguide you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. That's his promise. He always, I do mean always, keeps his word. Verse 11 to continue on. Now, when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. We were out there, and it came a great earthquake, and I mean to tell you, there was one that showed up like lightning and rolled that stone away, and we freaked out. We passed out. It was something miraculous. Verse 12, they're passed out. They don't know a whole lot, okay? 12, and when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money into the soldiers. Why would they, why would they give these two, they, they passed out on watch. It, it's quiet money. They don't want them to tell what happens. They don't want them to tell about that earthquake that rolled the stone away. They don't want to tell them, him, him they, to tell them of the miraculous appearance. They give them a lot of money. And what would you take to keep quiet? You cannot be bought if you're a true Christian. You're going to hold to the truth, nothing but the truth. Verse 13, this is what they would say, saying, Say ye his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. You went to sleep on the watch, and they came and they snuck him out right under your faces. Well, and verse 14, and if this come to the governor's ears, if the government hears about it, the Romans, we will persuade him and secure you. We'll bail you out. Doesn't matter what it is or anything. We will bail you out. You'll be safe. Just be sure and tell this lie. Liars come real cheap, it would seem, in lifetimes. They whether it be in religion and, or people that would try to deceive. And certainly uh, it's been that way ever since Sodom and Gomorrah, that people lie and lie and say, it's all right, everything is fine, just do what you want. That's not God's way. And do you think it, with blood money and blood to lie, do you, uh, money to lie, do you think this protected their souls? They're due to hell. They sold their own souls. What would you take for your soul? There, this is a time that Christians must take God's word very serious. Don't think he isn't watching. He is. This same angel of the Lord knows what's going on. He watches very carefully. And just as he, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, that sort of perversion will bring him down. He will thump gourds. He will shake nations. You can count on it. But the beauty of being a Christian, when you repel such things, you're, you, have, you are inoculated with God's truth and wisdom, whereby they have, it must go around you. They cannot touch you. Why? 
because you're one of God's elect. So uh, blood money won't cut it. It did in this place for who? The wicked. Let's go with another verse, please. Verse 15. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. Now, don't try to lay that trip on our brother Judah, true Judah. This is the Kenites. They're the ones that brought this to pass and blamed it on our brother Judah. But uh, it, they are as guilty as sin. And certainly uh, to uh, continue the lie, there have even been books written on this subject. One, one of the greatest from many years ago, I, I don't even want to say the name of it because I don't want to call attention to it. It's a, just flat out lies from beginning to end uh, about how the disciples stole the body away. He was drugged, and it would seem druggies can come up with a lot of weird things of the mind that deceive and harm people. But uh, so it is that uh, they, they brought this to pass. And you know something? There is a certain type of people that if a higher echelon says it, it's got to be so. I heard them say it. Well, they'll lie to you, friend. Your heavenly Father won't. God will not lie to you. And I promise you one thing. It will always come to pass as it's written Man will sell you a bunch of malarkey, and it will never usually turn out. If, it, if it's contrary to God's word, it's going to fail. I, I promise you, if it is contrary to God's word, if it pushes things other than God's word, such as Sodom and Gomorrah did, I promise you it will fail. It, it, is, it has failure marked over it coming out the gate. So... Always stay with your Father and be blessed. For when you are blessed, you're blessed indeed. So always be prepared. There's, there are, well, these were government people. I didn't know the government would lie. Oh, you didn't? Well, the government here did. And I mean lied big time. Well, how did I know what to believe? It's real simple. Read God's Word. He's still sitting on the throne. He's still very much in control. It's always, I do mean always, going to happen as it is written. You can count on it. Verse 16, to continue. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, finally getting it together here, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. That's back to 2632. He told them. You go there, I'll be there. He always keeps his word. Believe that. Accept it. Verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Can, can you believe that? Some doubted. Well, we, we know from other works uh, who the doubter was. His name, uh, uh, Old Doubting Thomas. Christ even said, here, put your, hand, put your hand in my side to prove it's me. Document it. And he did, and then he believed, and then he worshipped. But how, you know, doubting can get you in trouble. It is good to be careful what you hear and what you perceive. It is good to spiritually evaluate what you see and what you hear. <clears throat> evaluate it according to the rule of God's law, that is his word. And you will pretty well always be blessed because God takes care of his own. This is why that when you see people that are true to God's word, you're going to see people blessed. Blessed with knowledge, blessed with wisdom, where they know and understand what's happening they know the chronological order of events, and they know how those events are going to fall, even especially in this end generation, which this very book of Matthew has, has uh, prepared us 
for that. We'll say a few words on that in a moment. Um, let's go with the next verse. They doubted but worshiped, some of them, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, do not read over that. All power. Think back when he said, I have told you, but it was the angel of the Lord. But then it was the Lord himself. I have told you. All power. Not, not just here on earth, but in heaven also, is given unto him. And therefore, I, I would, uh, if you really want to pick a bad party, Pick some party other than him because all power is his. No one else has any. Satan can take you right to a pit. There's another power out there, but it's a loser. It's a loser all the way. It's filled with perversion and things that go against God's word, things that mislead people. You, you can pick that way. It, it's, you know, you've got free will. It's your choice. But um, all power every bit of it, not only on earth, but in heaven also, rests in his hands. So don't let anyone cover those outreach saving arm hands from you, because that's where the power lies. And that's why you can take it very, very serious in Luke chapter 10, when he gives you power over all of your enemies. Because all power rests in his hands. And you're one of his followers. You're one of his elect. You have to do things, and when he is in all power, he can give you the ability to accomplish those things. Though it may be a troubled world, and the world may be a shaky place, if you're truly serving the living God, the power is in his hand. He will give you the ability to do exactly what he wishes you to do. And so it is. So when you look to where the power lies, that's your answer. He's it. The whole universe which he created for his pleasure, all power reverts to his hands until his enemy has made his footstool. And God's elect here on earth will see that they go under his feet because they serve the living God. Verse 19, what is his instruction? Go ye therefore and teach. Do what now? Teach. Well, what do you teach? God's word, of course. You can, and what is this all nations? That's, that's all ethnos. That doesn't mean just the house of Israel. It means teach everyone that all power is in his hand, both in heaven and earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, better translated. Now, then what does that mean? Now, what does that mean? Well, I, I was only baptized in Jesus' name. My church only baptizes in Jesus' name. Well, what, what does Jesus' name mean? It's Yeshua. And what does Yeshua mean? It means Yahweh's Savior, which is the Son, and where those two are, always the Holy Spirit is there. It's the same. Okay. Now, what about baptize? What, what does this word stem from? The etymology of it comes from so that you understand it comes from the makeup of, let's say that you have a piece of white linen and you want to dye it red. So you take the crimson dye, and what do you do with the white cloth if you want it to become red? You submerge it. That's what baptism means, to totally submerge. Otherwise, if you wanted it solid red, all you'd have is a bunch of dots if you just poured a little water on it, okay? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be getting, you wouldn't be fulfilling God's order. Teach 
and baptize. Baptism, Christ was baptized. He, he cuts the wake to show us what he would have us do, and certainly you are to follow that example. And, um, and certainly uh, teaching is an is a honorable thing. Many might say, well, I, I don't think I could ever be a teacher. Your, your life teaches. The way you live your life makes you a teacher. If you live your life serving God and you're blessed, you're a walking signboard for Almighty God. That signboard written all over you is you're a child of God, blessed of God. That's why you're successful. That's why, and, and does that mean, well, no troubles are going to come my way? No, it doesn't mean that at all. God doesn't necessarily deal with hothouse lilies. He, he's got people that can cut it, that know how to handle the tough stuff. They've done tough. They know how to do tougher. But they do it with his help, and they're always successful in it. And, and so it is that uh, you, in, that, that is a form of teaching, is simply living the life. Others see and are drawn to that. They want some of that. They want that warm feeling that you have when the Spirit is in you and blesses you, loves you, guides you, leads you. And, and um, that, that is one of the greatest forms of teaching. Verse 20 to complete this chapter. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, what is that we teach them? Part of it, no, all things and whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And so he is. So he is. Many people are spiritually blind, not physically blind. But many people are spiritually blind. And when you teach and observe the things that God commands, then God will see that you are blessed. You can count on it. How, how, how rewarding this great book of Matthew, with he giving you commands to do when, when he sits at the right hand of God with all power of earth and heaven. No wonder we're blessed. No wonder we're successful in taking his word chapter by chapter and verse by verse and taking it around the world. When he's with us, he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. And how precious and how innocent is that it started out with that star in Bethlehem that led the shepherds and others to that birth of this one that would be when you would see him, that even that babe you would have seen our Heavenly Father. And how that he would tell us in the 13th chapter of this book, hey, uh, this is important that you know what happened at the beginning of this earth age. The good children were planted by our Heavenly Father. Satan came along, and he planted some children also. He's talking about Cain and his offspring. The devil came and planted them to warn you about the Kenites, which is a Hebrew word that simply means the children of Cain. And if you do not understand the parable of the tare, you won't understand any of Christ's parables because it warns you of the enemy and where he resides. And then we come on to that beautiful, wonderful chapter 24, which gives you all seven things that are the seven trumps, seven seals, and seven vials, all in one chapter laid out of exactly what would happen to you in the end. That number one, you were not to let any man deceive you that would come claiming to be a Christian preacher, meaning coming in Christ's name that you're going, you're not going to fly away, you're going to be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, and you're not to even premeditate what you will say, but God will speak through you, the Holy Spirit will. Where not only you, but the whole world can hear the truth. 
a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. What a time to serve. <clears throat> and what a book that brought all these things forth. And how that you were not to premeditate what you would say, but leave it in God's hands. He would do the talking. You're told the equivalent chapter, Luke 21, they can't harm a hair on your head. And as it was written there, some of your parents will even deliver you up because they're going to think he is Jesus. And they're going to ask him to forgive you and bless you when you know he's Satan himself as the false one. And that's when you do God's work. I mean, shine like a, 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 a child of God in bringing forth the truth and the word. That's what this book of Matthew has done for us. And then we look and, oh, here, here after that tribulation of Antichrist, here comes the true Christ. Not to fly us away, but to join us for uh, the millennium to teach his word. And every knee on that first day of the millennium, bow, millennium bowing to the Lord Jesus Christ. That was, that was Matthew 24. And then immediately in 25, he gives us the ten virgins. Th this is people that claim to be Christians right up to the twelfth hour when the wedding was well into the 11th hour. I mean, they claim to be Christians. There's just one problem. They don't have any oil in their lamps, which is the truth of God's word. Too late, Charlie. You either have the truth from God's word to withstand the attacks of Satan, or you're going to bow to him. It's that simple. But that's what, that's what this great book prepares us for is to follow him. <clears throat> what was his instructions? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That was Matthew 13. That was Matthew 24. That was Matthew 25. That was the very word itself to bring you through when the wrath of God strikes the enemy. It, he's not angry at you. You shine like a, a flower of God. That's what true teaching is, is teaching the Word of God. Book of Matthew, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Won't you do that? But please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or some organization. We will not judge people. Why? Well, we've got to judge. He doesn't need our help. But you do have the right for spiritual discernment. That keeps you out of a lot of trouble. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, it's always a pleasure. Got a prayer request, we can do away with the number. You don't need that, you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He sits at the right hand. All power in both heaven and earth are in his hand. That's why, why wouldn't you talk to him then? He can arrange things when you're sincere. He can assist you when you talk to him. Talking to him is prayerful. And certainly, that's what he loves you. 
So best to always start your prayer letting him know that you love him. Because that's what he wants more than anything, is your love. He created you for his pleasure. Make sure you give him pleasure. Father, around the globe we come. We love you, Father, and we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. And question time. Looks like it's Patrick from Florida. Pastor, is it biblical that only 144,000 get to heaven? Please give me scripture. Well, you're, you're quoting from uh, Revelation chapter 7, where it, it gives you the, the 144,000, but then when you read on in chapter thir verses 13 and 14, who are all, who's this multitude that have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb? There's, uh, you can't count them. They were set free because they loved the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're there. No, those are the only ones that God uses to teach and further the word. Susan from Idaho. I have to evict a family. I tried to evict them once the, they know how to play the game, and they won't even answer the door. It hurts my heart to do this, but there is nothing I have not tried to help but they are taking advantage of me. Why should I, what should I do biblically? They won't pay the rent and it is starting to cost me. Well, it, it is your livelihood. You know, uh, this is why we have God's law. And this is why we read in Romans chapter 13 that we obey the law so the law can, will back us up. So, um, what you need to do is you need to go down to the sheriff's department and let them know what your grief is, what your problem is. They are there to serve you, not to harm you, not to do anything negative against you, but to serve you. And therefore, what is right is right and what is wrong is wrong. And uh, it, it would seem, um, Susan, that you need some help. Compassion is a beautiful thing, but you can't lose your property over it. Uh, and if people are taking advantage of you, that's not right. They're not good people, or they would not take advantage of you. Every, some people fall on hard times, but they need to work it out with you. If they won't even open the door, you can't work with them, so it's time for you to take the next step. Talk to your local sheriff. John, John from Arizona. Please explain why you don't believe in the rapture. Because it doesn't exist. God doesn't believe in the rapture. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel 13, verse 20, he says, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. They cover every knuckle of my outreach saving arms. Um, so uh, the word rapture is not in the word of God. What, what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where most people are misun take it wrong, it says you have to always pick up the subject and the object. God doesn't stick tricky things in. You, you can, if you understand literature, you read it and let it flow. God's word is simple. And all it says in that chapter is, if you believe Christ rose from the dead, well, I hope you do or you're not a Christian, then you better believe all those that are asleep or are dead in him have risen also. They're not out here in a hole in the ground. They're already gone. They're not, they're not raptured, as you would say. They have simply, as Christ resurrected, they have risen. They're with him. And then he says, at the last trump, that's the seventh one. The Antichrist comes at the sixth one. What you want to be worried about is what are you going to do at the sixth trump? Because the true, true Christ doesn't return until the seventh. The child can count from one to seven, understanding the chronological order of events. So, uh, because Satan's main message will be, I've come to fly you away. That's the reason I do not believe the rapture, because it is a, a fixture placed by man and in the year of our Lord, 1832, a false teaching that has spread because it's easy. You don't have to study God's word. You're going to be gone. That's a lie. You're not. God expects his troopers to stand and uh, keep the word of God present. <coughs> okay, Brenda from New York. 
Oh, uh, my husband has severe nerve damage, okay, and his legs were paralyzed. Uh, our problem is he is committed to God, and he takes every word from him as you read it completely to heart, and he is questioning whether God would approve of this mechanical device inside his body. He has started to not use it. Well, well um, um, Brad, Luke was a physical, was a surgeon. Luke was a medical doctor. God gives our doctors intelligence, especially Christian doctors. And he gives us minds that we're able to alleviate pain. And he, he expects us to use that to our advantage. He doesn't want us to suffer. So um, I, I thank, thank you for studying God's word and listening, but God does not want his children to suffer. And when you have this device, use it if it alleviates that pain. And because these Christian doctors, and there, there are a lot of Christian doctors, don't ever kid yourself. Uh, I, I know that for a fact because of uh, our, uh, who studies with us and so forth, and, and even people, uh, I just know. There's a lot of Christian doctors out there. I'm not going to drop any names. Lisa from Michigan, do you believe that we are or about at the fifth trump? We're in the fifth trump. The fifth trump is a time of learning. Learning what? Learning who the Antichrist is. We're given his name in both the Greek and the Hebrew so that you can't miss. And his name is Satan, the destroyer. We, we learn that in Revelation chapter 9. And also, that's the chapter where God shortens the three and a half years to a five-month period, whereby we know we can cut it. We're children of God. We'll come through just fine. Joanne from Georgia, why, why do mothers betray their daughters to the Antichrist? And you're thinking about Matthew 24 and Mark 13, where it's stated there that when the Antichrist comes, mothers will betray daughters and the father of the son, because they think he's Jesus, and they're good Christian people, or claim to be. And they truly believe, they believe the rapture story, and they think it is Christ come to fly us out of here. And naturally loving their daughter, they want him to save her. Because she's a good girl, the mama knows that. It's just that the girl has read God's word and knows the false Christ comes first. And she's not buying it. But mama wanting to save her little girl will tell the Antichrist that she's a good person. Forgive her. And he's going to say, bring her on in and let's talk to her. And of course, that's our destiny. That's our time. That's the hour of temptation. Only we don't find him tempting, but a lot of people will. That's when God will speak through that daughter and the Holy Spirit, will, his word will go out. It's written in Luke 21 that even the gainsayers will be convinced by what God's children say when they're delivered up that way. It's a destiny and a purpose, so the mother ultimately will be very proud of that daughter because that daughter during the millennium will be in a position that she can help that mother get her act together. Bill from Oklahoma, what are the two Bible scriptures that confuse people most about the rapture? Well, I think I just used them. I think I, I, I just, uh, it, it's First Thessalonians chapter 4. It really confuses people. Any moment doctrine. All they would have to do is read on into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And Paul said, hey, don't let my first letter mess you up. I want to talk to you about our gathering back to Christ. It will not happen until after the son of perdition, that Satan stands in the holy place claiming to be God. All they would have to do is read the Word. And Paul makes it very clear. 
the other place is anytime, like even in they'll use Matthew 24 and Mark 13, whereby you escape the hour of temptation, they think that means you're going to fly away where you won't be here when the tempting happens. That's a lie. The way you escape the temptation is you have the seal of God in your forehead. You know it's Satan, and you do not find him tempting. You find him to be a perversion and an abomination, and you will stand against him. There's nothing tempting about him. Therefore, we escape the hour of temptation because he's a crud, and we know it. A, a spewer of perversion all over the world to pull people's mind away from the real word of God. Uh, Dan from Georgia, in the first earth age when Satan was kicked out of heaven with one third of the angels and the earth was destroyed, how did uh, Satan and the angels survive? They weren't kicked out. God, rather than destroying them, destroyed the age. Okay. That's earth age. He destroyed it, why? because he wanted to send the Savior. And uh, you find where a third followed him in Revelation chapter 12. But then God uh, destroyed that first earth age as, as uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 so stipulates and brought in this earth age, the age of salvation. Hoping with each one being born innocent of woman rather than following Satan they'll follow Jesus Christ by giving them free will, then if they choose to love God, they overcome. If they don't, then they're bound somewhere I sure don't want to go. Marion from Texas. Seals, vials, and trumps. I know that the Antichrist comes on the sixth trump and that the true Christ comes on the seventh, and that I will be in my spiritual body because I will not be deceived by the Antichrist. Now, you'll be in your flesh body when the Antichrist is here, okay? It's when the true Christ is here that we're in the spiritual body. I learned this morning that the seals are the seals of God and they are in your forehead. It's the truth of God's Word in your mind. What does that do for you? You find Satan to not be tempting but an abomination. And you know God has told you what's going to happen, so you're not going to be deceived. Uh, and God will know this and know that I belong to him. And, and so it is. God knows it all anyway, okay, that you love him. And um, his knowledge is precious. It prevents deception. You know, it, it is a beautiful thing that in the book of Matthew and in the book of Mark and Luke 21, the, main th the first thing Christ warns you about is don't let somebody come in my name and deceive you. In other words, don't let somebody claim to be a Christian preacher or teacher and deceive you. He bring, I mean, he's right up front with it, letting you know where Satan, Satan loves to work from a pulpit in deceiving people and uh, bringing perversion into the world, assuring it'll be all right. Well, it's not all right. If it, we are supposed to teach the things that Christ commanded us to teach End of story. Do you know something? Perversion certainly wasn't one of those things. He considered it to be an abomination and will have nothing to do with anyone that participates. Uh, okay, uh, this would be for Susan from, from Oklahoma. Is there anything wrong with me being cremated? I don't want a funeral. I want my ashes scattered over the ocean and to be cremated uh, as I remembered as I was in life. Would God be against this? No, he would not. Uh, and uh, there's, there's nothing. When we're through with these flesh bodies, we're through with them. <clears throat> and you have a beautiful spiritual body, as it's written in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 6 and 7. Instantly, you go into that spiritual body you know, it doesn't get old, it doesn't age, it doesn't get sick. It's your real body, quite frankly. And uh, w when we're through with these flesh ones, we're through with them. But we are to remain in them as long as God needs us here to fulfill his word. Um, from, this would be, um, 
this would be MZ for a Minnesota. I've been studying with you in James that tells of works. I am disabled, I'm a disabled man from a forklift accident when I was working. Me and my family study God's letter. My question is for someone like me, what are, what are, what are doing works, or how, how do I do works? It really bothers me thinking I am lazy or worthless. What can I do to plant seeds and do? You know, um, a handicapped person that believes in Christ is a fantastic witness. Perfect. And when Antichrist comes, that's your destiny, is to stand against him. You do that simply by spirit. That's all that's required. And where you're studying and bringing your family into it, you're taking care of your family. It, it is a man that will not cause his family to study, that will not support them, that is worse than an infidel. You are handicapped, and God's children of Israel are always to take care of the handicapped, and that's why we have laws that do exactly that. It certainly does not mean you are lazy and, uh, or any part of it. You have a strong witness because it impresses people able-bodied when they see the faith in someone that is handicapped. You, you hang tough. You're doing real good. I'm proud of you. God is proud of you. Uh, Wanda from Virginia. My question is, why do I have to be 73 years old to learn the truth? Seems like a great waste to me. Well, thank God you have it, though, now. That's great. I, I love the Lord and am sending. Okay, thank you. I am concerned about church folks today. Keep up the great work. We're going to, and they're going to be fine. It, it, does, it is sad that more of God's Word is not taught in churches today because we're in that generation of the fig tree when certainly of all times it's needed that people should be in the Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. The, the real saddest part is this, that when membership begins to fade and people seem to lose interest, do, do you understand what's wrong? They're not teaching God's Word. If you teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you cannot take care of the, of the congregation. It grows and grows. That's why we have our Father. He takes care of it. That's why we call this church Shepherd's Chapel, because the shepherd, Jesus Christ, he's over this church. He's the only one that can handle it, because it goes around the world. And it is a fantastic thing that he does in bringing people to the truth, and we thank him for that. It's not man that does it, not this man or any other man. It's our Heavenly Father. He is so good to us. We can love him and appreciate that. Warren from Montana. Question, were, were the Lord's creations during the first earth age created with free will? Yes. Everything with him is free will because why? He wants them to love him and it to be true love. Otherwise, if he creates somebody that has no feeling or emotion, then that's not real love, and he won't have anything to do with that. He wants the real thing. Question, kindly explain, what is the difference between being begotten and being created? Well, begotten means you're born of woman, of the water, and to be created is to be created by God, and the creations took place in the first earth age. Um, other than the beginning of the flesh, they were created, formed. Uh, Mr. Waters, can a man and a wife baptize each other? And what is the words you say before you dunk them under the water, before you submerge them? All right, you, you read it today in the next to the last verse of, uh, of the great book of Matthew. Go forth and baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if, if you are a student of mine, if you want to go the next step further, baptize in the name of Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, Yeshua, the Son, and the Holy Ruach, uh, our, that Holy Spirit. You can baptize each, uh, any Christian can baptize another Christian. 
Now, I warn you, not all churches will accept that as a, as a legitimate baptism, but God will, okay? That's, that's what's important. Christ will accept it. So, best to you, you can, again, you read uh, the last two verses in the great book of Matthew. Billy from Oklahoma, uh, thank you for watching. Some, someday I, thank, my, thank you and the staff, someday I would like to attend one of your services and find it, but I find it hard to get around with a wheelchair or your facilities made wheelchair acceptable, accessible. Our, our main church, like on, on the weekend services, is uh, accessible. And um, the broadcast uh, station, we can make arrangements. Uh, but uh, our, our church building itself is handicap proof. I mean, it's, uh, it's very accessible. And uh, and you you would be welcome, but you would want to be sure and call and make sure there was your the times of the service. Linda from Ohio, uh, Linda, I'm gonna have to hold this till tomorrow because I'm out of time. I, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, but most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it's the letter He has sent to you, so that you are informed on His intentions and what He requests of you. When you study that letter, it makes his day. And when you make God's day, boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. He loves you for that. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. of Eli and Samuel, the last two judges of Israel, sinned against the Lord greatly. The people of Israel witnessed the corruption of the priests and judges and rejected God as their ruler. The people wanted a man to be king and to reign over them instead of God. First and second Samuel records the history of Israel evolving from a theocracy to a monarchy. God warned Israel that a man king would take their sons to serve in his army, their daughters to serve as cooks and bakers, the best of their fields and vineyards would also be taken and given to the king's servants. Israel refused to heed God's warning and said, We will have a king over us, that we also may be like all nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So first Saul and then David were anointed king of Israel. Would God's prophecy or Israel's expectations of a man king come to pass? You'll enjoy many hours of in-depth Bible study with Pastor Arnold Murray as you study 1st and 2nd Samuel.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're ready to get back into our Father's Word. God's promises. And again, just as a reminder, and as much as we've had one lecture on this subject, God promises, and you can count on it. That's exactly the way it will be. But most of His promises are conditional meaning there's something you must do 